Good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to have Oliver Drothbaum here from VMware Tanzu talking today about architecturally evident Java applications with J molecules. Um, it was always an idea to have in here talking about something like spring data or other stuff he did. And now he's actually like exploring the, the world of architecture and how to build um, better software in different styles, obviously, um, with the Spring ecosystem. And of course, also like other topics, he's really very much interested. So I know him for a while and I'm really happy to have him here. But since I'm the guy from the Java user group, I have to talk to you first about like some um, organizational things. So like one will be, please use the chat to talk to each other or if you have technical issues, um, ping Marcus, he will be there and will answer your questions about technical issues with browser and so on. And then obviously, if you have questions I need to ask Oliver, um, please add them to the Q&A section. Because when you add your questions to the Q&A section, you're also able to vote up the questions. And I will actually take them in order from top to down, obviously. Great. Um, I'm also like, I also like to talk about um, the next Chuck events. Like one of the next ones we do is about uh, remote pair programming. And Adrian Balboaca will talk about that since he has written a book on this topic as well. And then actually, like on the 2nd of November, um, Thomas will talk about mistakes and trade-offs when optimizing the hot path. So it's about like typical problems we have in our applications and like what could you do against those things. And then actually the, first one, uh, the third one we have in the pipeline will be about JavaX measure. And that means like how to get like this measurements proper or the right way in, in Java. So he will talk about um, the standard like within this JavaX measure. But obviously you can imagine we have way more than those talks in the pipeline, but also we have lots of like on-site talks planned. And the first one or the next ones will be also like in November. So I'm really looking forward to those events as well, where we will do the things on site, because I think like the, the main idea of the Java user group is actually to meet and exchange and yeah, not only doing remote talks. So I'm really looking forward to this. But now actually Oliver, um, the stage is yours. And I think you can introduce yourself a little bit better because you have a very special position currently within VMware Tansu. And um, I'm sure you will explain us like what it is and what you are doing right now or what you are exploring and these kind of things. So I will actually take me out of the screen. Um, the stage is yours and I will jump in with questions as soon as they occur. All right. Um, thank you, Patrick, for the introduction. Welcome everyone to this session on uh, architecturally evident Java applications with uh, J molecules. As uh, Patrick mentioned, I'm working for VMware and I have done so for over a decade. Uh, right now it's going to be 12 years next March. Um, and I've spent most of the time in uh, working on the Spring Data team, um, leading it for some time even. And um, part of my motivation to work on these topics was always that like expression of architectural concepts. Like if you think about Spring Data, uh, at, at its core, there's the repository abstraction and it's been basically an implementation of the repository pattern taken from Eric Evans' um, blue book, a Domain Driven Design, uh, tackling the complexity at the heart of software and actually turning that into a programming model for Java developers, right? And it's become a very ubiquitous um, um, yeah, abstraction. So it's basically the, the repository implementation pattern uh, that you find in Java applications also taken away to other uh, stacks as well. And that's kind of where the, my, my interest grew in, um, in, in these kind of um, bridging the, the gap between code and architectural concepts, architectural elements. Um, yeah, so I handed over the 
uh, the lead of the Spring Data Projects to uh, Mark Paluch uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, I think, and um, still working on the team, helping them out with, with a lot of stuff, but also spend a lot of time um, thinking about these architectural problems and how to actually produce technology that helps you to write architecturally evident code. And we're going, going to go into what that is um, in, a, in a second. Uh, a second pet, pet peeve of mine is um, building good monolithic applications, um, which means that we've, we've seen that, um, that trend towards uh, microservices in the last couple of years. And uh, there's been some kind of backlash because people, of course, overdid with, with the architectural concept. And um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do or that, ten that the topic of modularity in Spring applications is, of course, not only one that uh, um, actually comes up with microservices, but you can also uh, structure your applications uh, properly in a more monolithic fashion. And there's actually a lot of support in Spring applications for that and technology around the Spring framework. And I'm actually writing a book on that topic. Uh, it's supposed to come out at the end of 2021. Uh, of course, we all know like books, just the software uh, might be a bit late, but um, yeah, parts of the stuff that I'm going to discuss today um, will be, will be well, not, actually everything I discuss will be in the book as well. So, uh, but in the book, there's of course a lot of more. Um, all right, so let's get right into it, right? Um, so we want to build evolvable systems. Um, why is that the case? And um, why does what, what do I mean with that? <clears throat> the fundamental or contrary to popular belief, the primary challenge of building software systems is not to initially build them, right? Uh, there's a whole plethora or a lot of people think really hard about how can we be even more productive? Is there a framework that allows me to create HTTP endpoints with less effort? And how can I actually quickly produce something new? Where unfortunately, that's not where the actual challenge is, right? Putting something out, creating something initially is, well, I mean, you can improve on that. That's just, that's just fine. But if we th think about it, we spend most of our time changing existing software, right? We, we, we have to uh, adapt to new business requirements. I mean, the, the time, hopefully, the time that the piece of software actually lives is much longer than the time that we uh, needed to originally create it uh, to create a, a 1.0 version, right? So the challenge is actually here. And you can now then ask yourself, okay, what, what does a 1.0 version look like so that it's actually easy to move it to a 1.1 version, to a 1.2 version, or even a 2.0 version. And to actually be able to evolve software, we need two, two um, very important things. First thing is that we need to be able to understand what we actually have there. That's not only the case for folks that join our team like later through the life cycle of a software, um, I mean, for those, it's particularly important, but even I find myself um, getting a bug report for something in Spring Data and then, oh, it touches a part of the code base that I originally wrote, but that's been like two years ago or two months ago sometimes. And I have to go back and read my own code and then either be mad at me or hopefully my former self has actually left some traces and actually like well understandable code so that I can in reasonable amount of time actually understand it, make sense of it. Right? Um, and that's where, we, where we're going to spend a lot of time on how we can actually write code that's understandable and that's easily, uh, like easily graspable basically. Um, the second part of that, so it is, let's assume we actually are able to gain an understanding of the code base in reasonable amount of time. We then of course also need evolvability of the code base itself. In other words, like we try to change that thing so that thing has to be changeable as well, right? And um, so we, we often um, apply certain patterns to the code base so that we 
of course, find out uh, or can learn about the code base and understand pretty quickly, but also um, achieve loose coupling uh, between application components, apply modularity, all these kinds of things are a part of that, right? Um, all right, so what is architecturally evident code then? Um, it's code that we can understand and that we can, um, that basically allows us to find the architectural elements that we have defined uh, in the code base, right? That's like a critical part of understanding because we, we, cannot, we cannot like take someone and immediately let him or her like look at the code and fully understand the, the complete context in which that, that particular class or something lives. Um, and we, we create these like different levels of abstraction and some kind of hierarchization, like from a class to a package, to an artifact, to a deployable, um, to actually like allow like the, the, the programmer's brain to just like capture a certain, certain context and then make sense of that. And a lot of, like pattern languages have evolved around that, like things like the DDD building blocks, like repositories, aggregates, factory services, and what have you. Um, just as the um, architectural concepts like layered architecture, if I tell you, oh, my system consists of a layered architecture, then you kind of, okay, have some certain expectations on the code base and kind of if I then show you the, let's say the service layer, then you kind of know, oh, there's going, there's going to be a presentation layer somewhere that will interact with that. Or there's a repository layer or data access layer below that we're going to need or that, that, that exists, but that we don't necessarily have to know inside out um, to actually understand the particular part of the, of the system that we're looking at right now. So what does architecturally evident code then mean? It's kind of like, okay, um, if we have these patterns and these, the, this, these pattern languages that help us understand the code base better, we would like to actually make use of them in the code base because otherwise, if we don't find that pattern language in the code, there's this gap between like our conceptual idea of what the code structure is supposed to be like and what we actually um, find and like, find when we like rummage through our IDEs or what have you. Um, the, the means of defining architectural structure can be like subdivided in like two broad categories, um, intentional and extensional elements. Let's start with the extensional ones. There's a actual, if you're interested in that more, and I was kind of like doing some research to prepare that talk and then you get you read that particular book. In this case, it was I think Simon Brown's um, Software Architecture for Developer that then pointed to uh, George Fairbank's book on software architecture, which then pointed on some scientific paper on these kinds of things. So you can actually get down a deep rabbit hole here on that. Um, and there is this particular paper that's linked in the in the very back of the slide deck um, that differentiates between extensional and intentional elements. What does that mean? Extensional elements are the things in your software architecture that you describe by naming them, by enumerating them, right? We say our software system has an invoicing module. It has a shipment module and it has a orders module, what have you, right? So you, you basically list, explicitly list the elements that you kind of construct your software with. And um, that's kind of the way you, you describe those, right? And for those components and modules that I just mentioned, um, there is an equivalent in the code base usually. So you could, we can find different ways of basically um, projecting the left to the right, right? We could say we um, invoicing and shipment become packages in our code base. They become build modules or they become like individual services if we want to. That's kind of like the, 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 the tool set that we have, but there's a very direct translation that you can actually apply. The same applies to things like the domain language, right? Concepts from the domain language. Um, we talk about like in this, we were going to stick with the e-commerce um, domain here, uh, email addresses, zip codes, addresses, customers, what have you, right? You can directly translate those into classes, the classes, methods on classes, the way you name fields, the types you actually introduce um, 
that's kind of all the extensional elements, right? Domain language and com components and, and modules. That's fine. And a lot of people actually do that and uh, or a lot of teams actually do that. Um, the tricky bit is about the intentional elements, which means or intentional means you're not actually listing all the things that are kind of um, that are available or that are you don't explicitly list them, but you rather describe them by their traits. So and what what falls into this is the uh, DDD uh, building blocks, right? So an aggregate, if you define uh, you define an aggregate to be like a type that, well, in this case, it's a, a like cluster of entities that has some consistency rules attached to them, right? That's kind of the definition of an aggregate. And it's, I mean, you can then go ahead and basically map them back and say, okay, customer, order, what have you, the class that I have, they are conceptually aggregates. But um, there's no like direct representation of that inside the code, right? It's like, okay, what is an entity? You can, I mean, JPA uses at entity like an annotation and uh, you can quote unquote derive that, okay, the class is annotated with the JPA entity are an entity, but there's other stuff that, I mean, that JPA entity um, is not a direct one-to-one -one mapping to let's say a DDD entity, right? So. Um, whenever you choose things like domain-driven design and the pattern language, you're basically lacking a lot of expressiveness. You can't really explicitly express value objects, aggregates, uh, repositories, also only through Spring Data. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, and it becomes even more um, obvious when you talk about architectural styles like layers, onion rings, uh, what have you, right? It's not that like people are unaware of that or basically throw their hands in the air and say, okay, then we just don't do it. Uh, what most teams actually um, use as a means to actually apply those concepts in their code base are naming conventions mostly, right? So you have like my order service or like when it comes to like the assignment of services or, or order repository, for example. Um, and we're going to see what it what 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 kind of challenge that imposes to like the 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 overall arrangement. So, what are the um, the building blocks basically of that entire arrangement, right? Our architecture, our code, and sometimes I've already mentioned this like uh, particular technology, like the Spring Stack, coming into play here. Um, so the, of course, most important building block is the, the code that you write, right? Your, the, your code, um, that you want to actually, uh, we get to that in a second, uh, want to actually keep, uh, pure to some degree, right? You don't want it to tie it to a particular technology, especially when it comes to the, to what we consider domain code, right? The, the code that actually models and expresses the actual uh, problem domain you're working in. Regarding architectural concept or architectural expression, you the the the, the scope is basically uh, twofold. Um, the first thing is um, you work with a particular set of concepts, just like the DDD building blocks. If we just let's take an example here, a simple aggregate arrangement that um, we we have an order uh, that consists of line items and that actually belongs to a customer, right? So standard e-commerce um, um, example, nothing fancy here. Um, the question like that already comes up is, okay, how do you actually express those concepts that we could, let's say we, we've thrown that on a whiteboard, we've defined, okay, um, order is our aggregate because there is the constraint of a minimum total amount of uh, like, of, or the, the, the order has to um, have a minimum total order amount um, of let's say was it 20 euros or something like that. And that's going to be controlled via the order aggregate. And um, there's also a customer involved here. And um, yeah, that's kind of the, the order belongs to a customer. So how do we actually express that? And like the, basically the stereotyping, right? How does that get into the code base? And the second question is, well, if we define order to be an aggregate, there's certain rules attached to the concept. And 
um, how do we actually, I mean, we could go ahead and try to find, to verify that our model actually adheres to the rules implied by the concept. Because if you looked closely here, um, there already is a problem with that model, which is that um, the order aggregate here keeps a direct reference to the customer aggregate um, on the, on the, in the customer's package, uh, which is something you should, uh, is supposed to be avoided. Uh, I'm not going to go into DDD details here, but we should rather um, refer to the other aggregate via their identifiers only, right? So there is actually some, some model validation going on that we can of course imply uh, or apply to, let's say the modeling phase in the whiteboard discussion. But um, if we were able to actually assign the concept of an aggregate to, let's say our order class, there should, there's probably also ways to actually uh, verify or find out about this, this kind of, this mismodeling to some degree, right? All right. So we have concepts and rules that we actually want to apply to uh, user code. And the, um, on the, in the technologies or those, those uh, concepts are often applied via use or by using certain tools and technologies, right? I've already uh, talked about the fact that we, um, that the Spring Framework, for example, comes or Spring Data ships the repository abstraction. Spring Framework itself provides a couple of stereotype annotation at service, at repository, at controller. They're actually supposed to assign certain um, architectural roles to the code base so that they've, these annotation have been designed with that thought in mind. Um, but they, they also get certain uh, technical functionality applied to it. For example, if you use the add repository annotation on a class and the bootstrap your spring application, those, the objects created for those class, from those classes will actually get persistence exception translation uh, applied, right? It's like most people just take that for granted or never really think about that, but it's kind of, okay, we have this kind of, this expression of a certain architectural concept um, and we use that to apply certain technology uh, to those to those things. That's fine. That's neat. There's just a problem with that, which is that um, we, of course, I mean, it ties the concepts to that particular framework, right? And folks sometimes don't want to actually uh, do that, right? They want to avoid any Spring Framework references, uh, which I can understand to some degree and some really overdue on that, uh, decouple things from, or decouple everything from everything. Um, but the, I think the even bigger problem is that, of course, Spring defines this, this set of uh, concepts um, only to a degree of like which aspects it parti is particularly interested in, right? Um, there's no add aggregate root annotation in Spring Framework because yeah, Spring Framework doesn't actually have to, or doesn't really any, there's nothing to, to apply to that. You could even go ahead and introduce it, but then it's, you're, you're doing that yourself, right? Um, all right. But there, we basically tipped our toes into that, into that, um, realm already. So uh, expressing architectural concepts through the use of spring in this case, but let's see what we can do about this. Uh, what we can use this for is that we actually um, use some tools that would then apply some verification, as I mentioned, model verification or um, yeah, general architectural rules to the code base. Um, two of those that I want to have a bit of discussion around uh, later are like JQ Assistant, which is um, a tool that basically throws your entire code base or the AST of that into a graph database and then lets you allow or allows you to, um, to define uh, graph database queries to both identify concepts in that AST and then in, in a second step also apply rules on that. Um, if you're more of a pure Java guy, for example, then um, ArcUnit is an, is, an, uh, is an equivalent to that. It's not like, it has a slightly different scope but you can actually write Java code uh, 
to uh, identify uh, patterns in your code base and then apply certain rules. We're going to see that in a bit. Let's first focus on how these, all of these uh, five things here are kind of related to each other in a standard or in, a, in an application as you see it today, right? So we have our developer um, writing our domain code and um, her using some tools to actually like define that code, right? Using Spring Framework or what, what have you, right? Um, or ArcUnit, JQ Assistant. Um, so um, what about the concepts? Where do the concepts live? As I already mentioned, um, they're mostly defined through either frameworks or the tools. If you use JQ system, we're going to see that in a bit. Um, there's a way to actually write, in this case, a cipher query to find all aggregates in a code base, right? Um, and the rules attached to those concepts, so an aggregate must only refer to other aggregates via their IDs, as we just had the example, is also kind of on the side of, of the tooling, right? It's kind of, it has to be defined in the way that the tooling uh, that we use actually expects. Um, so the tooling is basically the means of definition of the concepts and the rules, and it's referring to um, framework or technologies being used with the code base, right? Um, for JQ Assistant, there is a Spring plugin, for example, that will happily identify repositories in your code base if they're Spring Data repositories or if they're annotated with the Spring uh, at repository annotation. There's also a JPA plugin that will identi happily identify uh, entities in your code base by looking for the JPA entity annotation, right? You see, um, like attached to, to, to the JQ Assistant plugin in this case um, and um, represented or defined through technological uh, means basically. Who's responsible for defining that? I mean, I, I mentioned the um, I mentioned the Spring plugin for JQ Assistant. That's kind of like then pointing to some technology. But if I wanted, for example, to identify aggregates, right, domain-driven design aggregates, then the developer would have to go ahead and basically um, write code, or in this case, a cipher query, to identify both identify the concepts and the rules. So it's you all of a sudden basically are drawn away from writing actual business code to becoming some kind of meta coder that tries to identify the concepts and tries to govern your code base. It's kind of a bit of a meta reflection going on on your, on your own code base, right? So um, what could, how could we do this different? So what if there was something, um, some secret sauce that would allow us to actually um, apply the concepts directly to the code base, right? So we can go ahead and without any reference to some particular framework stack, allow us to express, this is a repository, this is a service, this is an aggregate route. Um, still, our developer, she would still be the one to, to actually have that, def uh, apply that definition, but she's the one who's writing the code anyway, right? So uh, there's some I'm assuming she's been part of the architectural meeting that decided like the structure of the code base. So uh, we can go ahead and um, apply that. So we could then, if we know about that, that secret source, um, the tooling vendors can actually go ahead and apply or pre-formulate the rules based on that secret source. So just like um, JQ Assistant Spring plugin referring to Spring Data repositories or repositories, it could just have a, a plugin predefined for that um, particular uh, secret source. And it, we wouldn't, or the, the developer, she wouldn't have to, to implement those rules herself then anymore, right? So we can basically get rid of a lot of work and as a side effect, actually get our code more pure, basically. Um, yeah. And as a, um, uh, as an icing on the cake, basically, we could even go ahead and try to um, eliminate the framework integration that we would still have to put or would still have to make our code code base, let's say, still work with Spring, for example. Um, we can actually like invert that relationship here. We could basically make Spring 
work with uh, that that secret sauce of 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 using our um, that we're using in our in our domain model. So what is that secret sauce? Um, as you expected, probably, and the title already um, suggested, it's uh, the X molecules project. Um, in particular, we were going to look at the, the J molecules one. Um, it's a project I started with uh, Henning Schwentner from WPS um, Hamburg and uh, Stefan Pirnbaum, a developer on the JQ Assistant uh, um, tool here from Bushmeis and Dresden as well. And we got together at certain conferences. We were just like chatting in the hallways and we're like, okay, we actually need something that we can express those architectural concepts in language specific means. And um, I like being socialized in the Java world, I immediately, okay, Java annotations, types, what have you. Um, but Henning is particularly involved in, in the .NET space as well. So we were like, okay, why even stop with, with Java? We could actually try to, well, it's not that we have enough, like just uh, spare time a lot and then we can go there, but conceptually, right? It's not something that, that would have to actually uh, stick with Java. So uh, under the X molecules umbrella, there is a J molecules, PHP molecules and .NET molecules. And um, as I spend quite a bit of time on, on that these days, uh, of course the Java um, port or part of that arrangement is the most advanced currently. But if you have friends that write PHP, I mean, I think I, on, on the Java, on a Java user group meeting, I can say you shouldn't have friends that do PHP, right? Uh, just kidding. Um, they're good people too. They just like wrote, chose the wrong programming language. Um, but if you, if you like have to do projects in, in other languages, um, there's stuff there as well. I'm going to get into this, what, what is available and what's not. Um, but we're going to focus on uh, J molecules for today, right? So what does um, J molecules actually consist of? It's a couple of jars basically that um, provide you with annotations and interfaces to express these, um, these architectural concepts. So it's pretty, like you could argue it's like, okay, what, what is it to talk, to talk about for that, right? Um, there's a couple of things that that get get into like if you act, practically apply those, there's some interesting aspects to to cover and solve here. But fundamentally, we allow you to express DDD building blocks via annotations and interfaces. We allow you to uh, express events as like annotations or interfaces, so you can basically express that a class is an event, um, and also um, that a method is an event handler. I'm going to get that in a second. Um, and the architectural styles part is split into like three different categories right now. Uh, there's support for onion architecture in classical and simplified form. Um, classical separates between domain and application ring. Uh, simplified only has a domain ring. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, this has been some back and forth on uh, why we do that. Uh, layered architecture, of course. Um, and there is, um, annotations to express like command handlers and queries for CQRS applications. We're actually in, uh, part of that has come from discussions with the Exxon team. Um, and we're um, looking into like closer integration with, with Exxon, either from our side or from theirs. Um, or yeah, so I'm going to get to that in a, in a second. Um, let's go with an example here and actually uh, go with the, back to the, uh, example we had before. Um, so we want to try to um, model that aggregate, that order aggregate, or we, what, what, what in, in, in code basically, right? And express those concepts. What would that usually look like? Or if you go to a brownfield Java uh, program and have a look at how they actually implement these kinds of abstractions, you likely to find something that looks very much like this, right? So um, it's a mixture of, okay, here's some domain code. Here's some, a bit of persistence. We try to get rid of some of the boilerplate using Lombok while producing other kinds of boilerplate, annotations mostly. But 
let's take it apart briefly. Um, there's a couple of JPA induced boilerplate, like the entity annotation. We need a no argument constructor, the add embedded ID annotation. Um, yeah, the relationship to the line items has to be mapped to a skate, cascade type all because um, we're going to get to that in a second. There is some, the, the, the fact that the order is supposed to be an aggregate has actually influence on the way that we uh, model uh, our persistence mapping, right? So line items is, or line items are part of the order, so they have to see that cascade type all, right? So we, the life cycle of a line item is basically attached to the life cycle of an order. Um, and yeah, the same for uh, the no ox constructor needed for the identifier and uh, the serializable effect that some, I think some, some code that is um, uh, required by Hibernate because it, it assumes that identifiers should be able to be held in caches and those might be written to disk. So you see how you actually have technology kind of leaking into that particular implementation, right? And there is this kind of, uh, you, this distinction between, oh, we want to, we, we do model our, um, our domain and we make use of JPA annotations to directly turn that into a persistent model, right? So we mix that, uh, we mix the two aspects like our model and our persistence technology, um, which creates like this kind of scattering that you, that you just saw, right? Um, the alternative to that is a dedicated persistent model that the actual entity, let's say a JPA less order would get mapped onto um, in the repository layer. And there's some heated, heated discussions about like which of the two is wrong, right? I don't even have a strong opinion on that um, because the, the, the argument made often is that um, like you want to, you don't want to let the technology um, constrain the way you actually want to model your, in this case, order class. Well, moving the annotations out of the class will not necessarily solve that problem because at some point you actually have to map that uh, entity or that aggregate onto something that is actually mappable onto JPA in the first place, right? So there's either a, a big gap to bridge between the two, which then like creates the same challenge basically. I mean, you can of course write, um, there's some mitigation point in the code base, but um, ideally the two are not that far from uh, far apart from each other, right? So if it's if it's really hard to map um, an aggregate onto some some database, then maybe the choice of persistence technology is not the best one, or you have to integrate with a legacy legacy schema. That's kind of a a, a different discussion then, right? And also that mapping code has to live somewhere. It has to be written. It's boilerplate as well, right? Um, so just keep that discussion um, aside for now. Um, we just like go with, with this for now, right? Let's accept that someone chose to uh, like annotate their, their class with, with JPA annotations. Um, what's also worth pointing out here is that I already got into that a bit that we actually express or implicitly describe traits of the aggregate of the architectural concept by actually um, choosing certain mapping, uh, persistence mapping settings here. Uh, you could argue uh, there's um, even like certain defaults of map of the mapping could kind of flip um, because of the fact that um, order is an aggregate root, right? Uh, unless that uh, that that type that we actually point to in this case, like a customer or a lighter item, is an aggregate itself. We actually know how to actually map those right to one to many aggregation uh, associations with a uh, cascade type all, for example. Right. Let's start. But we're going to get to that in a bit. But let's start with the question of um, how do we actually like apply the the constraints and the uh, establish the 
the fact that we're actually dealing with an aggregate using existing tools. Like if you just let's go briefly over that. If you uh, in JQ Assistant defined uh, wanted to identify all aggregates, then there'd be no choice. Like with standard Spring, uh, standard Spring and JQ Assistant arrangement, um, you'd actually have to look at all the repositories and within the repositories inspect the generic type signature and because you would only have repositories um, declared for um, uh, for aggregate roots, right? If you declared a line item repository, that would still violate the concept of an aggregate, um, but it would be harder to detect because like, how do you actually even detect that, um, that the repository definition for a line item is invalid in the first place, right? But uh, let's not, not go there for now. There's one query, you don't have to like fully understand that, but it's, uh, you describe um, that something is an aggregate by that, that set clause in there is adding that metadata to the, to the data model. And um, we need to reference technology again, as I, as I said before. And in a second step, we can then go ahead and basically say everything that's declared an aggregate must not have fields that are of types that are aggregates themselves. Right, so that's kind of a two-step process, and I would have to actually um, write both of the queries here, um, if uh, unless I'm using something predefined. Really, in ArcUnit, it was would look something uh, something like this, pretty similar standard Java code, though. Um, we they said this aggregates extractor is basically hiding the left column you just saw in Java code, and then you can um, write that particular uh, piece of code there um, that would uh, then verify uh, the, actual, the actual rule, right? So again, code you have to write and code that you have to write in terms of the means of the tool. Sorry for the breaks, um, I've caught a bit of a cold, so yeah. So to summarize the, the original attempt is, or the original approach is architectural concepts implicit in the code. You as a developer have to actually identify them and uh, you, the means of the definition are tool specific. So whatever kind of tool you, you choose that you have to buy into that basically. So. Let's start with the first thing that J Molecules allows you to do. It allows you to actually add the concepts explicitly to the code base. To do that, you'd, you'd um, add a new uh, dependency to your code base. Uh, in this case, we're, we're, um, we want to um, describe DDD building blocks. And um, by that, you get access to um, certain interfaces and annotations, and that we would change your um, your um, declaration of these types to, in this case, the type-based model, or that would implement the JDDD or um, J Molecules uh, aggregate root interface, and the order ID would implement the identifier interface. Right. So, so far we've just added code, but that allows us to do. Um, I mean, for one, it's we can now basically navigate our code base and immediately find all the aggregate roots, right? We could just like do a like browse type hierarchy or something of aggregate root and we would find them all. It's pretty, they're pretty, pretty easy to identify. And also they're speaking the, the architectural language. That's kind of like a nice thing to have as a starter. What we could also do is then I use the JQ Assistant Maven plugin and like pull in the J Molecules plugin for that, that basically contains the definitions of the concepts kind of just in this case says everything that's either annotated with add aggregate root or implementing the aggregate root interface um, would be identified as aggregate. And then um, it also uh, executes uh, the, the predefined rules about aggregate relationships, about the like value objects having to be immutable. Um, that set of rules is still in flux. So we're like constantly adding new ones to them. And there's also means to se ex explicitly select the rules you want to apply. 
it just doesn't like it's Maven, you know, that it's hard to get on a on a single slide with, with all the XML tags there. Um, but yeah, you can do that. The point here is you basically you don't have to go ahead and define all these things yourself anymore. Uh, um, the tool vendors can actually integrate with J molecules to then um, predefine the rules. The same for ArcUnit. It's even like simpler than that, or uh, not simpler, or not more complex than that, actually. Um, there's this J molecules DDD rules that's coming from a, a J molecules ArcUnit jar that you would just put on test scope, and then you just run um, a test, and that would then, using ArcUnit API, verify your your code base. Right, that that's kind of it. Um, Exactly. So rule verification is one thing. Um, another interesting aspect that, that the presence of those annotations and interfaces is that you can actually now extract documentation about um, your code base, right? Um, if you think about like your software project in terms of the C4 model by Simon Brown, for example, uh, you have context, container, component, and code. Um, like the latter two, the latter two uh, diagrams, like the container, uh, the component, and uh, code diagrams, are usually ones that you don't want to manually create, but rather create from inspecting the code base. And if all you have is just classes, then it's hard to actually like detect what is even a module inside your code base, right? Or what is even uh, for that particular module, what would be interesting? It would be interesting would be like, which Spring services does that, Spring Beans does that module publicly expose? Which events does it li list or listen to? Or which events does it pub uh, pr publish basically, right? Do you remember we have this JDD um, or JMolecules event um, artifact in which you can describe classes as events. So it's kind of easy to find those. Um, aggregates are a good are a good candidate for, for that kind of stuff as well. And there is um, um, inside the modulus project, it's a separate project I um, probably won't get too much into for now, but that has already integrated with uh, J molecules um, to actually take your Spring Boot application class. So if you have a standard Spring Boot pl uh, project and you've kind of organized it in a certain way in terms of packages, then you can just like write this additional line of code saying documenter for my Spring Boot application and write module canvases. A module canvas is exactly what I just uh, spoke about, right? It's kind of, okay, there's some definition of modules in there and it will actually create an ASCII doctor snippet that effectively renders uh, to this. So it will inspect your Spring application or Spring Boot application and it find, will find the interesting parts or pe the parts that are interesting to people that say, I want to understand, let's say in this case, the customer's uh, module, right? In this case, it's a package. It could be an artifact or what have you. And it will find all the Spring Beans, group them by their stereotypes or by their, um, yeah, you can define a custom grouping if you want as well. Um, it finds all aggregate routes. It finds all the um, events that are listened to and the ones that are published and the, even the, the places in the code base uh, in which those events are actually created, right? So uh, there's a sample event that gets created whenever we um, instantiate or initialize a, a customer. All right, so that for documentation purposes. I, I I just wanted to get the point across that, okay, as soon as these concepts are like easily identifiable in code, you can have other integrations built on that that produces value add uh, from you using those. The problem is a bit, um, we actually have ended up with more code, not less, right? So, uh, like all the all the annotations are still there and um, uh, all the boilerplate that we have to um, create. And sometimes like the Lombok annotations for the NOARCs constructors, for example, are just there solidly for JPA purposes. So 
what if we could go a step ahead and um, actually eliminate that boilerplate? Because as I mentioned already, a lot of these mappings are kind of a testament to the concept that we've just expressed we look at, right? So order is an aggregate. So um, we know if we have an aggregate and we want to persist that using JPA, we will no need a uh, no arcs constructor, right? Because order also has to become a JPA entity or if we use something different like MongoDB or something, there's different kinds of rules that um, allow us to basically project the architectural concept onto some techni technical application like persistence in this case. Um, all right, so what do we do? Um, remember our JDDD, um, J molecules DDD uh, artifact? Um, let's add a build step. Um, and the build step with um, using ByteBuddy in this case, um, the ByteBuddy Maven plugin, and let that transform our code to using um, the J molecules ByteBuddy plugin. That um, does the following. So um, that, that that plugin is kind of inspecting your class path. So if you have JPA um, on the class path, it will do the right thing, quote unquote, for a TM for JPA. If it uh, if you have Spring Data JDBC, for example, it would do the right thing for persistence. And MongoDB is also supported. Um, and it will actually understand aggregate root and it will remove the need to actually um, add an entity. Uh, the no R constructor can be done and also the equals and hash code implementation pointing or in, or just looking at the, the, the identifier like the, the primary key of that class uh, will also be actually implemented onto the class. Uh, we don't need add embedded ID because we know order ID is an identifier and uh, we don't need the the boilerplate one to many mapping because by definition line or we see that line item is not an aggregate root so by definition it has to be a one to many mapping here um, and um, the same goes for the order ID and like it can actually also automatically implement serializable for you right so we can remove those annotations or and and the, that that ex, uh, additional code and then uh, just let but the ByteBuddy plugin do its thing. So it kind of, because it's IDE independent, it would just like be triggered whenever you compile uh, or build your project. And then you will see something like this happen. Um, order gets a default constructor, it gets an, an additional annotation. Um, um, the identifier mapped to an add embedded ID, yada, 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 like all these things. This stuff is of course guarded in a way that, okay, if you have an at, explicit add entity on the class, then we'd, we'd just skip that, right? So whenever you um, add something specific to your liking, or if you want to derive from the defaults, then we would just back off and do nothing basically. But it allows us to turn, basically um, get rid of most of the, the technical boilerplate needed for JPA persistence in this case. The only thing, and I actually kind of like that, the, the way this looks here, um, the only thing that is st still explicit is the thing that needs to be custom, right? Which in this case is the add table annotation because order is a reserved keyword. So we have to basically rename uh, the table mapping to that. But other than that, we basically end up with something that's look is pretty pure. It doesn't see anything or it doesn't, like have to get any any technical noise, JPA induced noise added, but actually is a fully persistible JPA entity, right? Which takes a bit of the heat out of that. Do you remember that persistent model versus persistence model argument, right? So it's like all that scattering is gone and like, um, yeah. <clears throat> One thing is still to be added or something that I kind of um, think is worth mentioning here. There's still a, a tiny problem. Uh, we still, um, there's this order ID um, field and there's this customer ID field. And it's like one is pointing, one is the ID of the order itself and one is the 
the customer. And um, we're actually not like just keeping a customer ID around. We're actually explicitly modeling an association to a customer, right? It's not like a customer ID just like for reference, but it's supposed to be an association to the customer. And you can actually express that by using the, again, org, j molecules, DDD association type. That's just an interface. And you can declare that um, or you put some generics into that and um, basically create um, an, an instance of that. And the uh, Byte Buddy plugin will actually make sure that um, the addition, the necessarily necessary converters in this case for JPA are registered so that the, the reference is still um, persisted properly, right? So you, you have an explicit, you make that associative nature of that field um, explicit in your code base. Um, for other persistent stores like uh, MongoDB and JDBC, this is just natively support or the association type is natively supported by uh, by the Spring Data modules. It's just that for JPA, we need to do that kind of dance because we can't teach JPA things from the outside really. Um, or we can, but having to use that particular route. Um, yeah, and, and, and advantage also of using association and it's some, actually something or oh, a good point to mention that uh, we've had a look at the, the type-based um, means that we provide to express this concept, right? The interface aggregate route, the imp implement, uh, the identifier interface. Um, th the type system in Java actually allows us use that we can express certain relationships uh, between like some of these concepts and let the compiler already validate the or verify the validity here. Uh, for example, the association is defined from something that extends aggregate root to something that is an identifier. Um, in other words, um, as we cannot have association to line item, for example, right? That would, would be something that just because of line item not being an aggregate root, but rather just being an implements entity. Um, so you can actually get the compiler do a lot of the like model verification or validity checks for you already. And that's kind of the, one of the benefits of um, like using the type system to actually express these things. And there's a couple of, couple of other, um, other aspects, but that would become too detailed here. Um, right. And I'm, I personally, I'm not that of a fan of, of annotations in the first place. Um, and it's kind of helpful to, to do these kind of things here. Um, all right, so we basically come from the left side of the story to the right side of the story by eliminating that and actually using more of our architectural language inside the code base, right? And that's kind of basically where we, where we uh, wanted to get. Um, so in the, in the approach on the right side, we have the architectural concept explicitly expressed in the code base. Um, we have, um, yeah, they are predefined. We don't have to actually define those concepts on our own. And um, they actually uh, defined by J molecules. So the concept side of things is defined in J molecules and all the tool integration and the framework integration is um, then also living with either J molecules or with the, with the frameworks uh, themselves. Um, for example, um, it's probably something that could even put a slide in here on that. Um, these there's of course service and repository annotations and the code generation that I showed you before will actually um, augment, if you, if you use a J molecules at service annotation, like by default, we would have to kind of make that component also a known to spring. And the code uh, generation step will also make sure that these annotations are translated like, like in either direction, right? So if you annotate a class with at J molecule service, then it will automatically get in the compile step annotated with at spring service 
in case you have spring on the class path so that those you can use those annotations to actually run uh, most of the, the code base um, you have uh, with spring framework the same for uh, event listeners or what have you you can use the j molecules annotations and they will happily happily uh, just become spring event listeners by the virtue of translating these annotations that's also the way that the axon integration is going to work at, at some point and to some degree right so you can keep those framework references um, out of your out of your code base um there's even IDE support for that. Um, Nexus SCP brought, uh, built the initial prototype. So for IntelliJ, uh, there is just um, some integration into that in Eclipse. I'm an Eclipse user, but it's kind of that, that project structure view that both has um, the stereotypes um, added to the, to the classes and in case you have like bigger packages and you prefer to group the the package content by um, by the stereotypes, then there's also a dedicated J molecules node. Um, right now, it always shows both. Um, I'm I spend a bit of time on on making or helping um, that to to make or to get this to work. Uh, I'm not an IntelliJ plugin author expert, so this. We should probably get some setting or something uh, worth uh, applied to it, so that you can basically choose which which style you want. But it's just been a it's been a nice showcase that okay, having that kind of metadata in the code base actually has value beyond the actual um, beyond the actual code, right? It, it can actually even leak into the IDE. There's also um, ideas that we share with other tools, uh, tool vendors that provide like structural validation of applications uh, that we can actually get the um, verification of the structure into the IDE. So uh, basically getting compile errors for invalid references to other aggregates, for example, like to stay with, with, with our, the sample we had. But that's like ongoing work. All right, to summarize, um, J molecules allows you to express concepts of your architectural language in the code base, directly in the code base. Um, for both DDD building blocks, like, I mean, of course, DDD is a big focus right now, but um, that's why I've like, shown the example using the aggregate uh, example here. Um, we can, a use case, of, a strong use case of doing that is being able to verify the code base against our um, modeling uh, concepts. And by that, basically, um, yeah, cl closing the gap between our architectural model and the code base or keeping that in sync and detecting whenever one diverges from the other, right? So that's kind of the idea here. Um, we can extract documentation, there's not, I mean, there's also a bit of a verifying aspect to that because you can then look at the documentation. Like, ah, does that even look right? Right for uh, modulus that I mentioned, there's like um, checks that there's no cyclic de dependencies between uh, individual modules or what have you. Um, and but generally, we can leverage the metadata that we put into the code base to actually generate useful stuff from it. Right where. Well, Without that metadata in place, it would be hard to. I mean, have you ever looked at a generated class diagram of some piece of software? It's just like utterly useless because um, you can't see the forest for the trees. So, but if you can identify like the important parts, then that becomes even that generated documentation becomes very, um, very helpful. And there is by definition no gap between what is in the code base and the documentation, which is kind of a, a great trade as well. And if you if you want to, you can basically get rid of um, boiler, a lot of boilerplate code. There's also nothing, completely nothing wrong with just avoiding that, uh, creating a dedicated persistence model of some sorts, but then you'd still um, go ahead and have, let's say your actual domain model just um, implement uh, aggregate root or what have you for the documentation purposes, the verification purposes and what have you, and keep that 
completely aside. All right, so the um, example you've seen is in that third link. There's a J molecules examples repo, um, X molecules, J molecules under the expected URIs. Um, we have a Gitter channel, not too frequent, uh, frequently used yet. Um, and there is a, an informal call every, I think every first Monday of the month in which we get together to discuss stuff that's currently hot. Um, if, if you want to, if you like inclined to join that, that community, uh, or that call, then, um, happy to just jump on the Gitter and, and I get you the, the zoom invite. Um, if you want to read up more on that, um, as always, Simon Brown uh, is a good resource. It's the the both both of the books, Software Architecture for Developers. Um, I spoke about the George Fairbanks one, um, especially the architecturally evident code uh, section on it um, is is really basically also what what drove this here. And from that, you basically get the there's even a should be a link behind that paper. Um, word uh, to get the the uh, yeah to the paper to the PDF basically that describes that intentional and extensional elements and why um, like intentional elements are most defining architecture and the other does design with a bit more of a scientific view on that topic and of course um, sustainable software architecture by Carola Lienthal especially on the topic of understandable and how or understandability and how pattern languages actually make um, the make software understandable help us doing that. To round this off, um, big shout outs again to Peter, Raphael and Bernd, for example, because they, uh, all of them have been like tremendously helpful in actually getting this thing to fly. Um, sometimes feel like I'm in a, in a "Quote unquote one-to-one -one consulting relationship with Raphael in the meantime on on, on writing bite body plugins, but uh, it's been very very helpful. Um, and yeah, um, if you want to become involved, um, I'm happy to take questions now or on uh, on Gitter later on. Feel free to get in touch, throw things at me on Twitter, drop me an email. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you very much, Oliver. So in the meantime, while waiting for a few more questions in the Q&A section, I want to ask you like one maybe dumb question, but like you're using so many different tools and technology. What's the next thing to add? I mean, it's like check your assistance, it's Arcunit, it's like Byte Buddy plugins, so on. So do you have any ideas what you want to add next? Because it seems like a huge zoo of tools <laughs> already. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, the, the, the idea, I mean, fundamentally is that all of those, I mean, we're kind of accepting that there is a zoo of already existing technologies. Um, there's also stuff like um, sonar graph for architectural validation. So that 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 space of ah, we want we have architecture and we want to kind of express it or verify things in our code base. There's a lot of stuff going on there, and that was actually one of the fundamental ideas behind J Molecules is to to create something all of those can actually attach to, and then it's often just as it is with like other technical decisions. There's so many different forces that influence the decision which of them you actually use mm -hmm. um so that we don't we don't want to be opinionated on that i'm very helpful or thankful for um uh like uh, stefan from the jq assistant team to actually like okay realize this opportunity and then uh like building that thing for jq assistant um we built the the art unit um um plugin ourselves not because like Peter didn't want to, but we felt like, okay, there's a lot of iteration going on these days, right? And because Stefan is involved with us, he can actually do or get to the same pace within, right within JQ Assistant. Um, something that I'm actually looking into and I try to briefly touch on this is like better integration with Sonar Graph, for example, 
because they have an IDE plugin that would take the checks into Eclipse and IntelliJ already so that we don't have to do that. So we try to join forces with, with um, different players in the field. Um, there is, we spoke to the Axon team, I mentioned that on integrating um, or the axon detecting JQ is, uh, J molecules annotations and interfaces um, natively, um, these kinds of things. So I'm, there's not a, a single thing that I think is interesting, but um, it's kind of like, okay, let's see what the community even brings up or themes, um, dooms, themes. I think things is important for them, right? So yeah, it, is it the documentation side of things? Is it verification? Is it the code generation stuff? We could do more there, but there's also a lot of folks that like don't like code generation, which I can sort of relate to as well. Um, I'm just we're just going to to do and see what what people actually accept or or think is a good idea. So you basically rely out on the community to, to help you doing the integrations and let's hope like they're in the end everywhere good and not have like lots of bugs that people would say, no, we are not using that tool because it does not work very well with um, J molecules or X molecules. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, cool. it, um, I feel like I'm a bit like being reset to like those 12 years ago when I actually like kind of started the, the Spring Data repository abstractions. Back then, when I was, uh, especially the, the the derived queries thing from the like find by username or something, which of course sort of is a demo feature, because like in the real world application, your queries are m very likely much more complex than that. But it felt like I was I was giving a presentation at some other Java user group, and we had folks sitting in their Java folks. They were like, ah, I don't trust this because like. Uh, this it's too dynamic. It's I'm I'm not sure. And there was a Ruby guy sitting in there, and he was like, "Come on, guys, we've done this in Rails for ever, basically, and it just works." And I'm kind of like getting that same sentiment uh, these days when when talking about okay, let's express those DDD concepts in code and let everything then just like be derived from that. That there's I can totally understand that there's some natural resistance maybe for that, mm -hmm. but um, it's, on the other hand, it's kind of, it, it has, it's, it has this impact on, on the code that you actually write and it has positive impact, I think. So and maybe in five years, it looks anyway different, right? So we get used to it and then we will just adopt yeah. it and yeah. use it as it would be very natural. You mentioned also before um the annotation approach that there yep. are annotations for things so was there a particular reason why you didn't show the example or is this like something you don't like so much putting more <coughs> annotations on things um it to decide between using one or the other is a trade-off again um annotations have the benefit that they don't have to be if you use them on a class, they don't have to be present at runtime, which is, gives them an interesting trait, basically. You can basically run the code without having the annotation in your project. So you could even go ahead and have a separate module that has domain code, but uses JPA annotations, for example, and then use that class without JPA if you want to. Um, and for some people, it, that kind of is an, is an important aspect as soon as you build or buy into that, um, into the, the interface-based approach, you kind of tied your code to J molecules, right? We are, we're a zero dependency project, basically. There's nothing in there but the interfaces and the annotations. And I mean, we have to like use something to actually like express the concepts, right? And you also go ahead and I mean, at this, if, if that's a problem for you, you can also ask, okay, how much, I mean, we've we've spent decades of using Joda time uh, in our code bases, and nobody really has bothered with that, right? Or thought, okay, this is a something we need to abstract from. Um, but in general, um, I I like that interface based uh, approach slightly better. There, it, this is has not even originated in J molecules only. There's a a blog post series that's also linked to from 
the Java doc of those and both the annotations and the types that kind of describe over a series of blog posts. John Sullivan, I think, was this this fellow's name. Um, the origin of a why why do we what's the reason for that association? Uh, we could there's an association resolver um, fragment interface that you can use on the repositories then. So it, it kind of like connects everything a bit more with each other. And then also, again, allows you to detect or avoid misconfigurations in terms of um, the relationships, right? The aggregate has to be defined or the ent entities have to be defined to be used in a particular aggregate and what have you. All these things, are currently not, poss not possible with the annotations in terms of not implemented in the annotations. And we currently have a debate of whether we would want to express the same level of detail through annotation attributes then, or right these kind of things. Um, but right now it's kind of the, the annotations are the less invasive way of expressing that. So if you're fine with just documenting and just verifying, um, then that's the, probably the way uh, you would go. And um, the annotations are supported for the code generation uh, part as well. So that, that's not that's not necessarily the uh, differentiator here. But um, yeah, I just, I like that. I like that kind of putting that stuff in the type system, right? So it's like a um, mm -hmm. matter of personal preference mostly. Yeah, okay, great. So let's let's go over to the questions. And um, right. Victor yeah. was asking, by using the association, now your order class is using the customer class. Isn't that bad from the DDD perspective? Even though it doesn't do much, but it's important. I, it's importing the class. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can definitely argue that. I mean, you, you could go ahead and... Um would you could just like leave that association type away if that's something that you you would want to um the the, the class or the type declaration at this point basically serves the fact that you can then go ahead and use an association resolver which is likely to be a repository and you basically through the type system um have kind of control that you can only use the proper association resolver and that actually returning um, a customer instance. So you kind of, you're, you're, you're able, or we are able to actually define association resolver in a way that we can then kind of pull out the correct type to return uh, from that declaration. Um, yeah, so the, there's still the, there's the type dependency, but um, unless you're, you're not actually using it within the aggregate because the association is solidly backed by the identifier. Um, so, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, if the comment, I was, I'm kind of like trying to interpret the question a bit here. If the comment was referring to the, my, com my comment on the original example that had this customer relationship to the other aggregate, then I didn't, my, my goal was not to prevent the type relationship. My goal is to prevent that, again, persistence related. If I materialize an order and I have an, a property of type customer, then I'm kind of forced into materializing the customer when I materialize the order. And that kind of leads into that rabbit hole of lazy loading, eager loading, all these kinds of things that even if I have a separate persistence model, I kind of have to mitigate them at some point, right? Then I have to use the repository to uh, query the order table and query the customer table and all these kind of things. So um, it's more of an instance level um, connection that I want to cut rather than being like isolated on the on the type level here because it's it's literally just the reference i'm not we're not using any kind of methods of that thing so it can arbitrarily change um but yeah that's that's kind of the, the compromise here great i think werner has a very um interesting question as well because i almost wanted to ask the same question already before and he wants to know that if one wanted to integrate chain molecules into an existing code base, 
-hmm. is there a good order to do it step by step hmm. i honestly haven't really thought about that um the way that i i originally introduced j molecules in the projects that i've done uh, that that i've introduced it to is it's always usually been the like the aggregate model but there's no nothing that i think would prevent you from doing it a different way you could uh if you if you're um for example if you use the um there's a module annotation in the in the ddd module um you could just go ahead and annotate packages with the add mod with add module and then immediately get the benefit of like in this case jq assistant being able to or add bounded context annotation we have that to basically create your context diagrams of your of your different bound context in a monolithic application um so it it could be definitely sprinkled on in terms of like the annotation usage and then see what this gives you and then basically find your way into it but there's nothing there's no no particular way that i would prescribe as as um oh there's a big gotcha if you do this before that then things will fall apart because immediate uh, initially it's basically just enriching the code base with metadata right it's even if you use the type system if you start with uh with the code generation then yeah it's probably you use that class you turn the code generation on and then you can just basically remove code and see what whether your code still works the way it's supposed to work but other than that no 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 particular order okay great um simon is asking isn't the identifier leak of jpa as well because the id class is only needed by jpa ah yeah good question um kind of i the the ent an entity comes with the concept of being identifiable right and that's that's also reflected in the type system or in the in the interfaces so we have an identifiable type and we have entity extending identifiable because identity is a core trait of an entity in ddd um and life cycle and all these other kind of things but it it definitely is is one of the aspects that separates them from value objects right because value objects don't have an identity so you could argue well it can have identity but not an identifier property um in this case i think sure there is some kind of identity in or the question is rather how do you map the identity within the domain model onto a uh, onto the, the the database identity and using the entity's identifier as the primary key is certainly a design decision i can totally follow that and you can question that or have let's say a different um a different idea of how to do that you could we could let's say uh, rather use generated values by a sequence from the database and just keep them around like keep them separate if we have a separate persistence model but um the fact that the entity actually comes with an identifier in the first place and that being like part of the domain and kind of assuming that would like at least for within a bounded context have like or be a unique identifier is kind of a um um makes it a good candidate for being used as a foreign uh, as a primary key i totally see that it's not that easy with ex existing databases where you can quote unquote have to mitigate maybe between the two worlds more but if if i'm starting a greenfield project um i would it's also what i wanted to get to with that one command where i said i don't want to the, the two models to diverge too much because that just requires then a lot of mapping which i spoiler plate and i want to avoid um so i i'd much rather go ahead and just like model my domain here's some, the concept of identity and now i'll keep my persistence model as close to that 
and then just stick with it. Um, I wouldn't even argue it's overloading the semantics of identity. It's just like repurposing that thing because it just maps so nicely. Um, because otherwise you'd always have to, you'd have to find something that is kind of al allows you to uniquely look up a certain aggregate anyway. So that concept ident of identity is not, isn't, it, it isn't really gone if you just remove the ID field from the entity because you actually still need it. Right. And then I'm basically kind of just in, I'm taking the other side here, um, bit of a devil's advocate, but, uh, by that I follow the DDD idea of making things explicit, right. And then keeping that field in the entity, but technically, yeah. Um, having identity and having an identity field is two different things. Doesn't have to necessarily align, but, um, I hope that answers the questions I've been like thinking sure while talking Otto, a bit myself. <laughs> I'm sure otherwise Simon will ask another question on this if he wants oh, to good. clarify. But anyway, the next question is again from Simon yeah. and he is actually asking that he, or he said <coughs> that he checked actually the IntelliJ plugin yeah. and as there are no um, spring annotation used in the project, yeah. there is also no support there. And this uh -huh. question is actually like, is there some plans to work with JetBrains together on this? Um, that's a good idea, actually. Um, I think if you, I'm, I'm not sure uh, because I'm not an IntelliJ user myself. Um, we actually just built a plugin basically because band one was band already kind of had a prototype for it. And the second thing was that with IntelliJ plugins, there's a kind of a predefined model of how you actually publish this thing. And with Eclipse, it's basically, oh, you have to have some update sites somewhere and then host it. And I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. I just wanted to experiment with it. Um, depending on how the Intelli IntelliJ actually finds the annotations, um, using the Byte Buddy plugin might just fix this because then you'd end up with spring annotations in the class files for those for those source files. Um, but uh, I'm not sure it, it could be that it actually operates on, on the AST that it's building from the source, but I'm not an. I think so user. too. I think that will be a challenge because yeah. for, otherwise first you have to build the project until you get the, the information <coughs> of IntelliJ um, yeah. perfectly on the AST on the source file. I mean, the, the issue is a bit that you, we can't just go to the IntelliJ folks and tell them, oh, here's the J molecule service annotation. And if you find that, do the same thing that you do for Spring, because whether that is the case is it kind of depends on, um, on uh, the, um, whether you actually then use the Byte Body plugin, for example, to add that, to, to uh, add that. But I'm, um, it's definitely worth, I mean, if you have a contact to someone working on the, on the spring tooling in IntelliJ, I, I definitely would love to at least like pitch the idea to them and then basically see whether, what they, what they reply. Uh, but I haven't any contacts my, myself so far. We've just built that plugin and published it to the marketplace like the J molecules one. Um, Great. So there is like a last question actually from Philip. He asks, what is the stability of byte body generator? Um, how many issues do I have to expect? Like Hibernate has sometimes quite some strange behavior, he mentioned. I mean, if you're used to Hibernate, then you're used to having issues, is that what are you saying? <laughs> well, the question is like, do, I'm just... do, you, do you experience some issues with the byte body code generation? Well, I, I mean, we, we've, we've um, it's been through a couple of rounds of hardening already. It actually led to a couple of features being introduced to the Byte Body Maven plugin, like incremental compilation. Uh, I've worked with Raphael on that. A um, couple of things in the native space, even. Um, and I think it, it works reasonably well. Um, the fact, or the 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 one interesting aspect is that Hibernate itself uses Byte Body at runtime to even augment the classes more, um, and um, we, I haven't run into like issues that kind of hibernate had with the, the, the methods and constructors generated. So that's all, all it, if in doubt, you can, 
um, still, I mean, you could just like keep your original JPA annotations and then we would just basically back off of that. And I mean, there's, there's like, you can, if you file a ticket, we, we can, it's not like we have like month long iterations on that. So if you find something, please um, report it and then have that removal in a, in a branch for a while and then just like try and see whether your tests still run and then um, I'd happy be happy to find like uh, or get reports of something. I mean, you know, I'm not happy to get reports of something not working, but I'm actually happy of getting reports of something not working. Uh, so it's it's um, um, I'm ha happy to help if if that's the case. That's even on short term. Uh, Great, and obviously that helps also to bring more stability in in everything in the project. Yeah, and, yeah, and, sure. up and the tools and so on. We, um, we've definitely refined just to, to close on this. We've definitely re refined a lot of things and uh, also made uh, a couple of things more defensive based on like feedback we got on in, in real world applications, right? So, oh, if there's an abstract mapped superclass, then we don't have, we cannot do certain things or what have you. Uh, but as I said, it's been a couple of rounds that, that really uh, fleshed out the rough edges for now. And I have a so couple of a couple of projects that already use it in production. When did you start with J molecules then? Like what's the time frame? Like how long does <clears> it take? <throat> oh Jesus. It's it's been that's hard to say because um it originally started if if you listen closely, I sometimes fell back into saying JDDD um when I was talk, uh, trying to refer to J molecules artifacts. It's been I, I've had a couple of ideas of like that in 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 a predecessor of J molecules, and I think the um, actual the, the the group got together. I think one and a half years ago, roundabout, we we took a bit of time until we decided to to put a one dot on it, um, and we all we we basically just start to talk about it publicly right now. Um, uh, Stefan. Um, Oh no, Henning discussed mentions it in his book that's just been out, like domain storytelling. I definitely have a like an extensive chapter on all of this stuff in in my book. So there's there's more stuff coming, and um, so it's been like one and a half years, like already, and pretty much flying under the radar because also it's kind of like it's been a long time. It's been a question of how does it actually align with with my day to day work and how much time can we invent, but or invest um yeah but it's de definitely something that we want to grow and that we want to um continue uh, developing on so it's not something oh i just wrote it here and uh, i need someone to maintain it going forward it's more of a uh, we actually we also we made um a lot of this spring data native integration for a lot of stuff with that so um there's mm -hmm. like um backing of the spring ecosystem of that basically oh nice to hear so yeah. i i have the last question actually in the q a list and i think then it's also like time to close afterwards yeah um, steven is asking can i completely decouple jpa and tddb concepts and he refers here, for example, use along as a ID or foreign key for a one-to-many relations, but have the DD model and the repository use a UUID and does not expose the primary key on the DD model at all. Oh gosh, I have to reread the details here. Foreign key on a one-to-many relations. Um, so the, the decoupling goes quite far um, in terms of the the code generation that's going on. I mean, um, what 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 happens on the mod model level is that with the move to either explicit associations or even if you just refer to customer ID, you kind of break the entity to entity relationship with that on purpose. Because as I said, like aggregates must not depend on instances of other aggregates um, and by doing that you already kind of um, you create these kind of clusters of entities that even with standard J jpa um, are much easier to handle 
and to map out of the box, right? Because a lot of the mappings just become ridiculously ridiculously easy if you if you do exactly that. Um, everything that's like an entity um, defaults to uh, eager loading, basically, basically for example, right? So um, you would always want to load the line items with the order because you put them into the aggregate, so they're part of that, so they have to be materials. At least as a default, you could still argue, okay, uh, for some reason I don't want that, but um, that's kind of that's kind of the the thing. So you and the, on the database level, that actually means that you're not necessarily. I mean, depending on how you actually create the schema from uh, for for those for those uh, types, um, you wouldn't even introduce um, foreign key relation relationship like strong foreign key relationships. I mean, you can do that, but um, it's kind of a question, especially if you have module reference or aggregate references across module boundaries, you'd kind of want to uh, not necessarily reference like in the, this or the other module to use the same schema or whatever. It's a bit of a matter of, of or the question of um, how much decoupling do you want between the aggregates. Right? I, I sometimes still like, still think, okay, having a foreign key relationship on the database level still makes sense but at the same time um you can't really en enforce those on the on the model level right this um and the the actual identifiers that i've shown you in the example they're basically backed by uuids or um string versions of that mostly um mm -hmm. that's that again is more a sentiment or a testament to the idea of being able to actually create instances that have IDs without actually having to persist them in the first place. So something like generated value long ID is kind of an anti-pattern anyway, right? Because uh, like long is just like everything is long. You could just, I mean, long is not a type really. Um, and um, the other aspect being uh, you you'd have to materialize the or persist the instance before you can actually call equals properly equals on them, um, so we're kind of in this. Okay, we kind of nudge you into using UUIDs as the backing property for whatever identifier implementation you have, um, and then that kind of means that in the domain code you would only work with those identifier types, and everything else the way they're mapped is um completely um hidden from that right you could could even be an interface i guess and then some implementation being chosen that kind of switches the backing types but i haven't seen anyone going going that far or trying to do that because there was likely no reason for you know. so i think i think um simon wants to push hard on me he yeah. tried another question and asks, like, why is there no service interface? Maybe you have like a short answer to that. I have a short one for this. Um, everything that so we always have annotations, and we usually only have um, interfaces for types in which the uh, we can use generics to actually control or imply rules on the relationships between the two. And for the standard stereotypes like services and repositories, there's just no other thing to actually attach them to or what have you. That's why uh, there's no um, interfaces for the architectural elements, right? It's just for the for the building DDD building blocks, basically. Great. Thank you very much also like for your answers to the questions. I know some of them were not very um, easy. All right. And I want to thank you actually for the presentation and probably you have seen this, um, this thingy. Oh, a Victorinox Swiss Army Knife. Yes, you will get it because it's like our speaker present from the Java user group Switzerland. That's awesome. Uh, yes, and that, that means like you will get it like in the next few weeks by mail. And we don't share details here, right? About like your address and, and so on. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> And then also I want to thank the participants who stayed with us and also like all the sponsors um, which make this possible. 
and also the people behind the scenes who manage and organize the things as always. Um, just that you know, if you have missed part of Oliver's talk, or maybe like if you missed like one of the other more than 50 talks we have done like throughout the last like one and a half years, we have a YouTube channel as well where things usually get published on Sunday morning. So um, subscribe, press the bell icon, and you get notified around 10 o'clock in the morning, right? We also have a, a Slack, obviously, that you can exchange. Um, we also announce our talks there, but also, of course, we have a mailing list and all these things. Um, but it's also like a thing if you have a question related to Java or maybe related to jobs or whatever, you can exchange yourself there. And um, when we end now the webinar, you get forwarded to the uh, feedback form. And we usually do a raffle at the end of the month that you can win a license of IntelliJ. So um, we really value your feedback so we can improve. And thanks a lot. And thanks a lot again, Oliver. It was a pleasure to have you. And um, I hope there will be like one time where we can do this in reality again, because as you told me at the beginning, you were never um, doing an on-site talk at the Swiss Java user group, but hopefully in the future we can do one. Sure, would love to. So then I would say have a nice evening and thanks for joining. Take care, everyone. Bye.